Okay, today we have with us the amazing Monique Ruffy, who has written this beautiful book here, which is just absolutely stunning. And also is the winner of the 2013 OCM Focus Prize for Caribbean Literature. And this is, as you can see here by the little sticker, the Costa Book Awards, she won the Costa Best Book of the Year. So congratulations. <laughs> Yay! Yes, yeah, very well done. <laughs> we have Leon, Leon, who's a senior lecturer in creative writing, whose short story collections phenomenally were shortlisted in 2018 for the Pritchard Prize and the Edge Hill Prize. And I, if I'm, I really don't want to butcher this name, but the Jalik Prize? Did Jalik. I say that right? <laughs> Jalak. Oh, Jalak Prize, yeah, my bad, okay, sorry. Um, so now I would like to invite um, you to give a brief summary or description about your book. I think this would be especially useful, especially with Leon's book, because it has not come out yet. So uh, yeah, Monique, maybe if you wanna go first. A description of my book? Or just the overall summary, like brief. Yeah, okay. no, I'm happy to do that. It's um, a story of a woman who was cursed and banished and exiled to um, be a mermaid and swim alone to eternal loneliness, really. And she was very pretty and very young and very talented, but she was also really pissing off the other women in her village because she was very pretty and very young and very talented. And she um, uh, is captured in, um, by some people who are fishing, trying to catch a big fish. And really the story is about after she's rescued, um, what happens next? Um, and does she beat the curse? Who becomes her friends? And can she live again? Can she make a life for herself again in this small Caribbean village? That's, that's really what this is about. Thank you very much. Uh, Leon? Um, I struggle a little bit with trying to summarize this book because it's got all of these characters in it and they're all doing a, a lot of things. But I suppose the best way to think about it is to say that um, uh, my protagonist, whose name is Xavier, who is a magical chef who seasons um, food with the palms of his hands and does all kinds of other things that are magical that I won't give away, um, is um, being forced to cook the most romantic meal in the world for the daughter of the governor who is getting married. And he doesn't want to do it, um, but he has to for a variety of reasons. And so the book goes across one day in which he's walking across um, his uh, made up island. It's a fictional island called Poppy Show. And um, he's walking across the island gathering ingredients for this feast feeling resentful and annoyed and um, not wanting to do it. Uh, in the meantime, at the same time, across the same single day, a woman uh, who he used to know, let's put it that way, um, has found out that her husband uh, seems to be cheating on her. She hears that this is the case. So she starts walking across the island to find out what's going on with that. And it's about the things that they learn on that day. And a series of very strange things happen um, maybe we talk about that a little bit later, but a series of very odd and magical things happen to them as they are walking across this island. So that's kind of a way to summarise or to start off talking about it. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so now we're going to go into our questions, our panel questions that we have. Uh, first one being, in both of your books, magic is used as a tool for transformation. What inspired your respective magic systems? Uh, Monique, if you want to go first. Well, if you commit to writing a book about a mermaid, that in itself is the, <laughs> that in itself is going, is a magical uh, proposition to the reader. So really it's like magical, magic times to the nth degree because already your protagonist isn't human, isn't, maybe she is, maybe she isn't, but there's an ambiguity there. And the other thing I would say is, is that all my books have an element of magical realism in them. I come like Leone, Leone from a region where magical realism is something that seems to emerge again and again. Um, 
it's a, and I actually, even from my first book, um, was doing it, was doing this thing. And I like, I thought, well, I have funny eyes or something, or I have funny, I have a funny, I have, I, I, I see things funny. And, but actually it's, I don't know, it's in the DNA of our region that we write from, Leonie and I. And so I, I, I inherited it. I inherited this, this way of thinking and seeing. And then there's also this idea, which Leonie might agree, like in Europe, um, which also has its magical realism traditions, they think they might think that the things that we see and do every day are improbable or unlikely, but actually in the region, many, many things that we see and do every day are absolutely real. They are not magical, they are real. So um, it's, 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 it's just, it's not a system. It's, 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 it's a literary way of being, but it's also a way of life. And I could say a lot more about it, but I think the mermaid was my, my big one. Like, like a lot of people won't buy the book because they're not interested in mermaids. <laughs> oh, I would not recommend that. <laughs> but that's my answer. She yeah. is a unique mermaid. I will say thank you for giving us Thank you for giving us a unique mermaid. Um, Leonie? Uh... Um, I think I completely agree with Monique, first of all, that we come from a space where um, the ordinary is the extraordinary and vice versa, and that the strangeness that, or the things that we call strange are part of our human community and uh, discussed as if they are real and probably are real. The way, for example, someone in a community might say, you know, all of the women should wear red underwear tonight because a ghost will be coming and so the ghost might you know come and mess with them so the red underwear will keep the ghost away and um you know uh, other people from other countries might immediately go what do you mean haha that's very strange that you're talking about red underwear and ghosts and the community is like yeah because that's a real thing you have to do tonight like wear red mm. underwear please. so this this inclusion of 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 the the supposedly strange yes uh, I'm, I'm echoing monique sorry honey i'm really repeating what you just said but the story for me actually in this novel and finding my way to magic realism really did involve me giving myself some permission because at the very start of my career and my first novels were very realist and I think it was because I was quite young thinking I, I need to be to to get my feminist credentials um, out there and I need to talk about race and I need to talk about these important um, you know uh, imbalances of power now and, and for a while thought as a result of wanting to talk about those things that therefore I had to be realist but then I got really unhappy <laughs> because mm -hmm. Back to Monique's point, because the thing is powerful and in us and important and bubbles out, right? So as soon as I gave myself permission to actually talk about those themes via the magical, the fantastical, the strange, the odd, the beautifully horrific, then I got much happier as a writer. I would like to echo what um, Leonie has just said, because I mean, I would say if you want to really look at my book, it's full of ideas about gender and race. It's very political. It's a feminist book. But ultimately, I think one of the reasons why readers might be bewitched or might be excited and why I was excited is because I just wanted to do the magic thing. It's just be a magician myself, a witch, and just kind of ting up, you know, just, just, just do it. Just yeah. write my tale. Just tale you know. Did you have a period in which you weren't doing it though, because, or felt like you shouldn't, or felt like those no. political chops are more important, or did you trust yourself from the beginning and just go there? Well, I think, I think it's interesting. Also, I'm I'm quite old now. I'm fifty five, and I've written I'm many old, books. I'm fifty one. Everybody is old in that context. <laughs> <laughs> I think I have written in the past. If I look at the white woman on the green bicycle. I think there was something I was trying to do there politically. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason why this book is different is because every, all my, it wasn't, I just, that all dropped like you're talking about. And the magic is, the truth is in the magic and the magic is in the truth. Mm. That's where I am with this book. I, I just stopped trying to be, you know, I just, wanted to indulge myself in the love of writing and telling a story. 
And I think maybe one of the most important things I would want to emphasize there, particularly since I know we have quite young writers in the room as well, is work on and, and cultivate that bravery now, you know. Um, really write what you like, write what pleases you. I mean, often, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not teaching at the moment, but I certainly taught for a very long time and Monique teaches. I don't know if you see this, Monique, but often our students talk to us about the work that they're doing in the classroom and then their real work that they're doing like on blog sites or fan fiction and kind of having great fun with that space. Often it's a fantastical space as well, not always. And we're often, in, we're encouraging them to say, could you please, you know, trust that part of you, bring that to the classroom, you know. Mm -hmm. um, the sense of what we should be is still operative in us as human beings, particularly at the start of a creative process. You should be what you are. And I know that the thing that appealed to me before I realized that the world was screwed uh, regarding racism, homophobia, sexism, you know, uh, imbalances of power, society, uh, power systems and so on. Before I realized that I was a writer. Before I realized that I was a writer who watched Alice and Alice, you know, slip into Wonderland or James and the Giant Peach or, you know, went for a walk and someone told me someone up the road just turned themselves inside out, Lord, what we're going to do. And that I was inspired by that before I began to pay attention to the systems and react mm. to it. So I think it's a natural space to be in. And I think people should yeah. try to get there faster than, than perhaps we let ourselves. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would, I echo what, I, what she said, <laughs> what she said. <laughs> I think we have a very good panel today. I think we're all going to get on very, very well. Um, okay, uh, I, I would like to say also that I find um, a lot of people when they write with passion and they write what they want to say, normally all these things will come out anyway. Their opinions on, you know, social class and mm. racism and sexism, these points will be made because you genuinely you think about them and you care about them so yes please writers if you're here be brave mm -hmm. um question two how is power transformed throughout your novel monique um in many ways um i'm working with an old story mm. and the old story comes from a patriarchal past so i've rewritten it in old stories, women are always witches or virgins that need to be taught a lesson and surrender. They don't have agency. They have to be married. Um, there are, it's problematic because in the late part of the 20th century, um, women became emancipated. We're educated now and we're sexually active without being married and we can make our own way in the world. Now, this is a whole new archetype that needs to be thought, you know, we need to think about the fact that the women in the stories of antiquity are in update, basically. So I've rewritten the myth and given back this poor exiled mermaid, her erotic rite of passage, what she has been, um, what's been taken away from her, I give it back to her. But also in the story, there's the story of Cupid and Psyche, where again, the young woman, the virgin, um, is taught how to surrender to Eros. And then the big prize is she gets married. And there's no, there's no talk about what happens after they get married in the old story. So I flipped this and we have David writing about, who is Eros, writing about the impact that Psyche had on him. He is writing about this woman he met who was an innocent virgin who taught him how to be a man. So I flipped the power structure in both the stories, the old stories. Um, and apart from that, there's, there's it's, it's anti-American colonization. Um, it's, it's, it's a lot of shit going down in this book. <laughs> and again, you know, I wrote it from my belly. I wrote it from my womb. I wrote it from my lower chakras. I did not, I don't think anybody needs a history lesson when they read a book. So there's a lot of flipping of power and um, there's a lot of, it's a, it's a feminist novel, um, but I don't want to hit anybody over the head with it. Um, it's a book, it's a story now. That was so, yeah, yes, yes, many times. But I wanted to, rever so just one, one, just one more thing. There's a sex scene in it and it's between a virgin and a lover. 
And so a, a woman with no sexual experience and a man with a lot of sexual experience. And again, I flipped it so that she's not going to lie back and be penetrated <laughs> where she has agency. And even though she doesn't know anything about Eros, she steps forward into, I mean, you know, she's an experience for him as much as she's about to receive an experience, she's about to give him an experience. So there's a lot of rewriting. In, in the process of rewriting a patriarchal story, I'm, I am using my feminist uh, late 20th century, early 21st century agency as a woman, as a writer, as a feminist, everything to flip the power structure throughout the book in favor of this poor mermaid. That's my answer. Thank you very much. Um, Yoni? Um, power, there are lots of, um, again, I think both, again, Monique, I don't want to speak for you, but you know, we've written complex books with lots of layers and writers <laughs> have to, you know, we, we, and we see the complexity. So it can be, it can be a challenging thing to, to speak quickly or to summarize what we intend, but in terms of the power. Certainly, um, the, the country I've created or the series of islands, the archipelago I've created is in some ways on the edge of capitalism. So there are magic toys in this country and um, they used to be just for the children of Poppy Show, which is the name of this place. And uh, over the years, um, the governor has started selling them to foreign, to everywhere else, because this is a a country that I'm suggesting it actually exists, but no one's really paying very much attention to it. And so suddenly Poppy Show has a thing to export, which is actually magic. Um, probably in our world, when we receive the toys, we just think they were particularly beautiful or we would be a little bit uh, puzzled about the way that they work, but no one's really paying attention. But there is something special about Poppy Show toys. But the idea that the way that the power is, sh is shifting is slowly this individual man is making lots and lots of money from selling magic. And what start, is starting to happen is that the very earth, the ground underneath people in Poppy Show is beginning to resist this. Uh, the earth feels that there is something wrong here and begins to do, which is why so many odd things are happening on this day. Um, because all kinds of, you know, well, people's bodies are starting to fall apart. You know what I mean? I don't want to give it away, but I suppose some reviews have, get, well, some reviews have given it away. Um, women's genitals are falling away from them. Uh, people suddenly fall asleep and have strange dreams. There's an increasingly kind of collective problem going on. And to my mind, it is the earth and the kind of the gods and the magic and everything that is, that is, um, that is true and real and authentic is crying out to say you're doing the wrong thing. And um, I suppose the only other thing I suppose I'd, I'd like to talk about in terms of power is that it kind of works on a slightly smaller level, which is that everybody in this country has magic. And some magic can be as profound as they could um, read someone's mind, which is of course a big deal. But another person might just have very good hair or never have flatulence ever, regardless of what they eat, or not be able to get drunk. Uh, so and so, and as a result of your magic, you are given a job. Because people say, well, if you can run fast, then you should probably be a messenger boy, right? So as soon as you identify your magic when you're a, when you're a child, the society goes, then you should be this and kind of puts people into pigeonholes. And again, I'm trying to say that uh, in terms of power, I'm trying to say, this is, this is ridiculous, it limits people. And the idea that we know what someone is and that they are destined to be a particular thing is inherently limiting and problematic. I suppose finally there's a hierarchy of magic, which is of course the man who is the messenger boy then is making a certain amount of money. Another person with a different kind of magic has been given power immediately is making more money. And so it's, it's, it's allegorical for capitalism being bullshit basically. She says in an articulate <laughs> fashion towards the end. <laughs> <laughs> Completely fine. Honestly, the vibe of this panel, that's what that is. Um, but I will say I am someone who's very interested in reading about character dynamics and power between two different characters. If that's something that interests you, it is done phenomenally well in both of these books. So highly recommend. Um, okay. How do your characters' societies or relationships transform them? Monique? 
Oh, well, this is all about, um, it's a love story. So there are three love stories that are going on in this book. The, the love story between the mermaid and the fisherman who tries to rescue her is profound. I think it has a profound impact on both of them. Particularly the, uh, the fisherman who is writing about this years later. Um, it turns him from boy to man, um, gives him, you know, a, a, a life, a life experience, even though she's only in his life for like four or five months. It, it's, that's it. It's the, it's the, it's the love of his life. And she, she um, gets to beat the curse um, because they have a, a love affair. Um, between life and Miss Rain, there's a political power struggle, a race, a race dynamic going on. And guess what? Love wins. Love wins. Um, but they struggle. They struggle to, to be together. And then there's a third love story <laughs> where uh, a, a child, a child is discovered that, that, that the man never knew about. Again, in the Caribbean, there's always a outside child somebody's got people the the family arrangements are very different and this somebody discovers two men discover their children two men discover they have they have children so i mean you know i i hope that in any book really that you know this is what's happening to the characters if it's not happening to the characters then you have to rethink your plot but um i think you want to throw people together and you want them all to um have an impact on each other. So I think that's what is going on in my book is that, I mean, I hate to sound corny, but again, this is something about the whole, you know, when you write from the region that we come from, um, there's so much injustice that you could get yourself caught up in writing back and trying to rewrite the colonial era or the era, you know, you could try, you could spend your life trying to rewrite history. And I, I didn't want to do that. I just wanted to write about love. It's a book about love. Lovely, <laughs> lovely book about love. Um, Leo, Leonie? I think it's a really interesting thing that we're so parallel, Monique. Um, I think something must have been in the air, except it took you maybe a couple of years to write it and me 15 years to write it, but whatever the case. Um, you know, mine is, is, is a love story too. Um, and again, a variety of love stories are going on. Um, and with all of their kind of complexities and, and challenges, uh, my primary love story is about the one that got away. You know, we all have one and I bet everybody's thinking this now, that one who it wasn't the right time or you were in a relationship with someone else so you weren't really ready and they just pass you, you know? Um, and, but that can stay with you. And often when you say that to people, they kind of ruefully smile and go, yeah, yeah, I know what mine was, you know? Now, we don't of course know whether if you actually did have a relationship with this person who was the one that got away, whether it would ever work, but that's part of the charm of it. And that's part of the beauty of it. Uh, my two protagonists really, I think probably should have been together and they met at the wrong time and then decided to be with other people. And so, this is simply about the transformation that comes from, I think I had this clear sense that we learn, you know, we learn over time, we learn what we need, we learn how to be, we, we, we learn how to forgive ourselves, we learn how to forgive our parents, um, and, and then we can love. Now there are all kinds of ways to love, including toxic ways to love that can be exciting and, and powerful and wonderful. But, but ultimately we learn how to love in a way that allows us to love ourselves. And these two, this is the day they get it. This is the day, and it's not, it's not just what happens on this day, but it's a culmination. It's like, this is the climax of their own individual stories in which they go, oh, I get what I need, I get it. And then there they are again for each other. And that's not kind of giving anything away. But you know what I love that you said as well, Monique? And I read an article about this the other day. Um, the importance of joy now for, for Black lives and for, for um, the lives of, of, of people who have felt disempowered socially. 
and that joyful narratives are also political and, oh, necessary. Yeah. and Jesus we need them you know mm -hmm. I don't think I, it, surely it can't be a coincidence that both of us have written books in which love wins I, 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 I feel it love is a power I hate to, I mean look, yes. I'm a 55 year old woman it is a force to be reckoned with and and my romantic hero is this big black man he's real political he leaves she leaves she white ass she, she he go off to the bigger island but he didn't reckon on the fact that he loved this woman who is the enemy polar opposite but love and I mean look I could don't get me started, but <laughs> don't get me started. Well, maybe I agree, we shouldn't get me started that because that's the point. Yeah. No, that's been the the heart of what we've done is to look at, to excavate, to understand, to celebrate what what love is, what connection is between and, people, and, yeah. how it makes us over again and again and again. Uh, and there's this opportunity for again for growth and for for. Oh, I don't know. That is what, let, let us be sentimental. That is what we came here to do, to connect yeah, yeah. in small yeah. dark spaces, to keep each other warm, to say, are you okay? To learn from each other and, and things get in Is the that way. sentimental? I don't know whether that would be sentimental. I don't That's care. very that's pure. Not that's not pure fair. love. Yeah, that's pure that's love. Not fair. To somebody here, I've made you a cup of tea, you know. Um, is that sentimental? No, that's very practical. That's like, that's that's good that's good that's good humanity so i i think you see we come from a region where we have three nobel laureates not one not two three and the one that comes from where i live trinidad said that women can't write because we're too sentimental mm. my paul said that not that long ago you know all need some love that we that, yeah the man needs some <laughs> love love in his ass so um you know, sentimentality gets a bad rap, I think. There's nothing wrong with like loving your cat. I love my cat. Yeah, me you know. too. Oh, I love my dog. So I think we should, we should be brave. And then it becomes a situation in which being tender or speaking of those emotions becomes this, you know, we're apologizing for it. We're feeling, no, nah, let's not apologize for it. Let us say that it, it it's not everything. Uh, clearly our social systems, you know, sit there compromising our ability to love straight up economics if you don't have money for food love gets harder but also if you don't have money for food they're it, it, not having love as well <laughs> then hell you know but we're getting away from you marissa sorry yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, just, really yeah. <laughs> I'm really enjoying it i and it's such a it is a sweet thing to finally be talking about you know I feel like as women, we do tend to apologize. I don't want to, I don't want to say we in terms of everyone in the world, but you know, I feel like a lot of women do tend to apologize for being, maybe for being softer or, or, or even for not being so soft, but I think yeah. we should just stop apologizing. If we want to talk about love, talk about love. If you don't want to talk about it, don't talk about it. But anyway. I think <laughs> the skill is to talk about all of its details in, in, in not new ways, because that's too pat but to find more details to speak about it, to say things that are authentic for you. Again, that's, that's the challenge actually. And actually, you know what, also Monique, so therefore what we're doing is highly intellectually challenging because we're going to a subject area that has been done over and over and over by men and women before us and will be done into the future. To look at it again, to look at sex and love the way you and I do again, trying to find- But I don't agree. I, I agree it's been done a lot, but not in the place that we come from. That's true. In the region, everybody is so busy writing um, about social injustice and mm -hmm. an anti-colonial ting, 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 mm -hmm. that people are writing about domestic, what it's like just to be, you know, lucky or unlucky in love. Love is, you know, these are things that aren't really necessarily deemed worthy enough of fiction. Yeah. And I think as we see more and more women emerging out of our region, both who live there and in diaspora, we're reclaiming, we're reclaiming some basic things. Whereas, you know, I don't think Earl Lovelace is writing about love. There's love in his books, but he's got like, you know, bigger fish to fry, you know, <laughs> social yeah. injustice and love, you know, come on, we're women. I mean, anyway, I think, I think it's a good thing what we're doing. I think it's a powerful thing as well, because for example, the, the character, one of the characters that I'm most 
intrigued by in, in, in my own book, because I feel her, you know, is a woman who, her name is Nia. And Nia has never been chosen first. Mm. Nia has, has been the woman who, she's the side piece, she's the fuck, she's the pretty girl on an arm. Um, uh, she's, she's, she feels as if she's never been chosen first by a man, this is a heteronormative, uh, you know, she's heterosexual. Um, and then when she gets married to my protagonist, she know in her heart, him not choose our first again because he loves this other woman, right? So she's had this, I was intrigued with the idea of a life in which you don't feel chosen and important and first and precious and beloved and how it makes her crazy. She gets crazier and crazier um, throughout and you realize the extent to which it has hurt her soul. And then when she meets a man, and again, this doesn't really particularly give the anything away, when she does, when she is offered first place, she don't know how to take it. And so a friend of mine who read an early draft of this book, even though Nia is not a primary character, she bawled for Nia. And in a way, Nia is the heart because even though the two protagonists find each other and are loved, this woman has never had that experience. And so it's, it's looking at emotional experiences like that. What is it to be single for a long time? What is it to, you know, there are, there are gay characters in this that are holding down deep in the closet, not feeling comfortable. So it's also, it's not just about happy, happy, joy, joy either. It's actually about the complexity of, of different forms of love, yeah. which is my yeah. understanding about mermaid as well. Yeah, yeah. Also, I would like to say I did a few tears did come out. I don't. I don't want to. I'm not. I won't say anything. But um, towards the end, there's a bit where I did cry a little bit for her because my heart just. What for Nia? Yeah. Good. You're supposed to cry. I know that I section. Did, you're supposed to cry. I did cry a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> you're supposed to cry. <laughs> <back myself. laughs> okay. Oh, sorry. Anyway. Um, oh, this is a very good question, especially for these times, and it flows very well with the conversation. So, have you ever read or experienced something that transformed your mindset for the better? And if so, what was it? Um, I, I'll answer that. I, I am a practicing Buddhist, and I walked into a, a Buddhist temple about 10 years ago. And I was, I can't remember what was going on in my life. There was some bacchanal, some man or something, ting, ting, ting. Something was going on. I don't know what it was, but it was some chaos going on in my life. Some and I, I signed up to do a meditation course and how to meditate and a bit about Buddhism. That was it. That was it. Boom. And I was baptized a Catholic. My mother, my grandmother, my great grandmother, they are Italian Roman Catholics. OK, I could recite the Christian mass like that off, off, off because it's been indoctrinated. But I had let I had no I had become basically quite secular and quite irreligious and I had no faith in nothing and I wasn't really practicing anything. And then about so I'm 55 now. I must have been in my actually I was 47. So less than 10 years ago. I walked just and that's why I moved to Bethel Green. I've moved to East London because I'm quite near where I um, practice and it's a Western Buddhist order, which again, is, there's lots going on there. But I, I, I learned how to meditate and I, I started going to Dharma night every Monday night, which is um, just talking about what the Buddha had to say. And I went for years, years and years. And then I, every Monday night I was listening to the Dharma and I was always like, no, but I'm Catholic, I'm Christian, I, this is not never gonna work. I, I'm, I'm good, I'm, I'm listening to you guys, but it's not an easy conversion. And then about um, three years ago, uh, maybe four, three or four years ago, I did convert um, and I am now a practicing Buddhist that drinks wine <laughs> and I'm still eating meat. And um, that changed my life for the better overall. I used to get myself into lots of trouble, <laughs> as Leonie might know. Um, but I, I've become a Buddhist. I've just become an easier person to be and to be around and to live my life and blah, blah, blah. I mean, I can't, I can't say more. Sounds like you found some peace with that. That it brought some peace 
to your life which a lot a lot of peace a lot of um just truth the buddha became enlightened and it's like he was a human being he wasn't a god and um if you practice buddhism life gets better just gets that's easier what that's actually what my mom says she said if she could be uh if she could convert to any religion she would convert to buddhism but she's already converted once so <laughs> i don't I, I have converted over time it's taken me the best part of a decade and um it doesn't you if you're born a christian or a catholic it doesn't fall away and i still think of god i still say oh god i still think of god god is always male and I still catch myself with these binary judgments, good or bad, heaven or hell. I still, it's, so it's a very binary, you know, we live in a Christian world. So to be a non-Christian in a Christian world. So if you're, a, even if you're a Muslim, whoever you are, Hindu, whatever you are in country like, you know, in the, in the Europe, in Europe, in the West, it's hard, it's harder. And I do, and it's impossible to be a Buddhist without a community, without a Sangha. I have a Sangha around me. So yeah, I became a Buddhist recently, last three years. That cool. Very cool. Uh, Leonie? I was going to say something else, Marissa, but actually as I'm listening to Monique speak and also uh, in, in this moment, decided to follow my mind as they say in Jamaica. So I'm gonna say something else. And, and this, may want, this may seem bittersweet or even negative, but I do think it's important and transformative. So about, I want to say 12 to 13 years ago, I started developing physical symptoms of all over pain and fatigue. Uh, fast forward, and it took a very long time, I was eventually diagnosed with fibromyalgia, which is basically a pain condition. It's a neurological condition in which your, your body thinks that it's in, in pain. Your pain system gets uh, overwrought very, very quickly. Um, and so suddenly, I had a new life, which was one in which I'm always in pain. And so I'm talking to you, I'm in pain. And um, there are good days and bad days. Now, I say this not kind of to get into a pity party, even though pity parties are fine and appropriate and sometimes one needs one. But I say it because actually weird blessing, um, because fibromyalgia is a condition that it, it, it makes your body almost like concrete is one of the best analogies I've come across. And if you stay still and you ignore the pain, it gets worse. So in the way that concrete needs to turn around and around and around and around. So fibro people are constantly trying to move their bodies around in order to, to mitigate the pain. Uh, so you might see me wiggling a bit as, as the evening goes on. And that's the reason for that. Um, this is the blessing. I, I couldn't ignore my health, my body, my myself anymore. Because if you ignore fibro, you'll soon know about it because the pain increases and the fatigue increases. So this, and, and this may seem odd, but, but over time now, and I've gotten used to it kind of, I'm suddenly seeing the blessing in it. It requires me to take care of myself. It requires me much faster than I used to in my 30s to go, how are you? What's going on? What's happening? Uh, where's the, where are the sources of stress? Because you know that's a killer and will you know, exacerbate anything and it exacerbates fibro. Um, you know, are you hydrating? Are you moving? Are you taking care of yourself? When's the last time you spoke to your best friend? When, you know, all of those things. Now, that doesn't mean that some kind of perfection has taken over and that I am suddenly Buddhist using your money, but I am, um, because I know what Buddhism is and I know it's not perfection. Um, it is huge perfection actually, but um, this one's a bittersweet blessing. And so that was my transformation. And also uh, now I suppose on one level, I am disabled. And that has given me a really interesting perspective on the body and on pain and on, again, the extent to which we need to be really supportive of each other and full of compassion for each other because we don't know what's going on. Because on the outside, I look cool, right? I look fine, like I'm just chatting, everything's cool. Ow, always, always in pain. And people find that really hard to get their heads around. Um, so that's my, that's my transformation. But it was, it's, oh, it's a weirdly good one. It's meant that I've had to take care of that. Yeah, very inspiring. And it is a good, a very important message. I think a lot of people truly forget until you're at that point where your body is just gonna shut down. You forget you just need to take care of your temple first and everything else can wait five minutes you know that is 
a very very important message i think especially especially in in today's society yeah okay um next question how was the genre of magical realism useful in pushing certain elements of your plot could you say that again um how was the genre of magical realism useful in pushing certain elements of your plot um yeah i think it is something i think if you're going to be if you're a magical realist you've just got <clears throat> the ability to almost do anything um so when my mermaid is caught um and take and and rescued um oh there was so much drama because she she transforms back into a human human but you know crabs are living inside her mm -hmm. and tings falling off her and she had all juk up with you know conscience sargassum seaweed and ting 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 and 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 things are falling off her like a whole ocean is leaving her when they realize she's no longer a host and and you know and the dog comes sniffing and the cat comes sniffing and the tail fall off and you know it's just i i just get to be do the best thing it's like the best gift as a writer it's like i am just doing my thing which is like going into my wildest imagination and of course it's plot you know because later on there's a bad woman who says where she where what you sell she tail how you sell you know what that thing what millions you know and so it's her she's a creature who has magic and um you know she's she's very different she's very different in her whole demeanor and of course anyone who interacts with her they don't get very far because and even david who wants to make love to her doesn't he can't use he can't seduce her like he might seduce anybody else he's met because she's so different he doesn't know where to start and everybody who encounters her they don't know where to start because she doesn't she doesn't she's not reading she's not on the same page she's not on the same page so nobody who meets her gets to communicate with her on their terms mm. they have they realize they've just got to start again even when life comes back he's like boy you know oh that's why it's been raining it hasn't stopped raining since i got here and it might have something to do with she and then of course there's um fish falling from the sky and voices they always hearing these women cackling and then the hurricane comes of course she brings the hurricane is part of her curse so there's just tons of drama in the magic i just get to do tons of things it's great you know, she she's a magical creature and she's not in control of the magic that she has and she sings she sings she sings like an opera singer and you know everything she does is enchant is enchanting the enchants and she speaks sign language uh, so there's a deaf character and they start to speak with their hands and i'm like of course this is how people used to speak before they had language they would like you know they would like they'd communicate with their hands and some people still do so there's tons of magic in this which gave me tons of opportunity to work in ways that were not you know every, every day but yeah. mostly she's so much her own person that like you know everybody has to kind of like rethink how they communicate with her i think for me it's a, it's it's it, it's possibly something i've mentioned before it's about magic um it, it's primarily about the way that anything is possible in poppy show and that people are having both an individual we see lots of individuals running around trying to work out their own you know their own individual stuff um but also the community is having a a change you know the community is becoming something else this book used to be much longer 
Um, it, mm. I think at, at, at its worst, it was probably, I wrote 600,000 words of it easily. I mean, you know, like six wow. words, wow. Which was ridiculous, right? And then kind of tried to excavate what was the actual point. And that's one of the reasons it took so long. And I can hear you moaning sympathetically, Monique, that makes sense. That's amazing, um, but, that's amazing. But it allowed for me to really get to know this place and this space and for it to almost feel like if you took me to poppy shows like oh yeah that that's real yeah that's true right i think it's somewhere in the atlantic ocean no the pacific ocean i swear it's somewhere it's very small um but that aside um so so given that anything again it's like monique is saying because anything is possible mm. but because essentially the land is vex and the people are changing into something else. There was a whole version of this story in which actually what was happening is that the people were becoming, their magic was becoming even more amplified. And, and, uh, even, and, and initially, um, the, I suppose the rule in Poppy Show is that you're born with one or a couple bits of magic and you kind of identify as a kid. And then, you know, as I said before, that affects your entire life and affects you economically and so on. In another version of mine, they were all becoming something else they were developing new magic. Um, uh, they were all perhaps even going to end up different creatures. And that was just far too complicated and had to go. But I suppose the point being that the, this is the disadvantage perhaps of magic realism and the importance of plotting. At some point, you know, magic, magic realism would just say, yeah, and this, and this, and this, and what happened to me initially, which is why perhaps the book took so long, is that I would dance off down the magic road and have great fun and write another plot and create another character. And then I've got another point of view character. And then I've got 16 point of view characters and 23 point of view characters. And, and this is not controllable, you know? Yeah. And so perhaps that was the disadvantage of the possibility of anything for me because I had great fun dancing off in directions that were never going to become something else. I think I could probably write another two books of Poppy Show, even though I have no intention of doing so. But what I know I'm going to do, and that's, but perhaps this is where the, the plotting in such ridiculous way has helped me, is there is the making of, I would say, easily 20 short stories. Mm -hmm. So there might be, a, you know, Poppy Show outtakes short story collection sometime I can see R.A. laughing his head off but yes um, yeah so magic perhaps initially was not a good thing for me in terms of you know narrative control mm. eventually I did I get that I hear that does that make sense for you as well Mon because well, no it's interesting because my that. book is very busy but very short no I have Mine written very long long. my memoir was like a uh, was quite long and but this book came in short and I don't know how, I mean, again, I don't know how I did it. And I also think the two books that I've written that have been successful commercially have been the least, um, have been the most complicated. Mm -hmm. And the books that are the most Caribbean, most back to front, most magical, the white woman on the green bicycle in these books, they've ended up on prize lists. This one has won a big prize. This book is written from the point of view of a mermaid, it's written in letters and it's written omnisciently. It's it's small little crazy book and people get it, they get it. And I'm like, uh, what am I trying to say? It turned out short, this book, and it wrote itself. To, and I know, I it's teach creative living. writing. I teach creative writing. I know everything about craft. I know all the things you're supposed to do. I teach it all the time. But this book fell out. It just, I just birthed it, went boom, it came out really quickly. I don't know what and, happened. And, and equally, I too, as a creative writing lecturer, know supposedly all the things about craft, which include not having, you know, 23 point of view characters and moving <laughs> around with the damn thing for 15 years and writing 600,000 words and then trying to get 123,000 words out of it. I mean, yeah, yeah. for God's sake, I've spent the last 15 years as much as anything else saying to students, don't do this. Don't do this. I am presently doing this. Don't do it. <laughs> Stuck in it, don't do it. And and so in a way I've learned by doing exactly the thing that I tell students not to do every day. <laughs> so I don't know, maybe they should do it. Maybe it's okay to write a book across 15 years. Maybe it's okay to just- the only, to I have a book that I also <laughs> spent 14 years writing and it was published in 2017. It was The Tryst. Yes. And I started that book when I was 36 and I published it when I was 52. Yes. And I started, I think, thinking about this book when I was about 30 and publishing it at 51. Yeah. And so 
actually there's something gorgeous about that I've decided I'm not going to be ashamed or embarrassed about that anymore yeah. something tremendously powerful about going through your 30s and going through your 40s and entering your 50s and writing about love and magic and then seeing how that manifests itself in different parts of the book and or, and and how I, I know more now and yet I know much less than I ever thought I would and the last, the very last, I think the very last two sentences are dedicated to and come out of a feeling about my present relationship. But there are, you know, we know we amplify and we exaggerate and so on, but there are sentences that have to do with relationships all the way through that kind of 20 year period. Um, it's lent itself to, to a multi-layered book. There's no one way to do it, no? That's the thing. Mm, yeah. That's the thing. There's no one yeah. way. No, I... I... I, um, with my, with the tryst, it was deeply, explicitly sexual, very, very explicit sex writing. And for me, I had to, I had to grow up. I had to get through the shame of what I was trying to write about. And uh, eventually I grew up. I just, I just got over it. I got through it. I wrote a memoir, very sexy, but I just, I just got older. And I was like, I'm a woman now. I can do what the fuck I like. And there's something gorgeous about that because, you know, we're all addicted to this idea of the next hot thing, the next you, you know, forgiveness, young people in the room. I'm not being condescending, but, you know, to be 20, to be the new hot writer, you know, I've had my days. Again, I won't speak for you, Monique, but I've had my days and thinking, oh, dear God, how am I going to get back into this industry? And then it's actually I'm writing better books now than I did then. And um there is something about the power of women in their 50s that for those of you in the room who are women who have not yet reached 50s, I was promised this in my 40s, it didn't happen, that magic. 40s, I think, is too fraught, actually. 50s, suddenly, it was just like, oh, I don't give a shit. That's so, <laughs> that's so lovely. It's so wonderful. And I can see some, some women in the room smiling in recognition or perhaps hope. Um, but but books that then reflect those stages of change, fabulous. More books by women in their fifties, and here comes my cat to say hello and agree with me. Oh my gosh, the star of the show, the star has appeared. <laughs> okay, um, one more question: um, Which characters of yours do you think transformed the most over your writing process, Monique? Over my process of writing this book. Oh yeah, I think it's I think it's it's David who is a fisherman. I think it's his book as much as it is a woman's book. I think he's writing at the end of his life. He's writing uh, letters, journal entries, and he's trying to get. He's sick and old. He can't fish. He can't go out to see his lover anymore. The mermaid keeps coming back. I think it's all about his transformation, and I think it's all about this young man who meets the love of his life and she teaches him how to be a man. I mean, I'm writing into toxic masculinity. I'm writing a, 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 a male character. You know, in the Caribbean, we have, um, you know, terrible problems with domestic violence and homophobia, child marriage, you know, this church is still extremely dominant um, and restrictive. And we have terrible problems um, with masculinity in the region. Mas men, Caribbean men need to heal. You know, they need to heal from so much. And um, I think it's a healing process for him meeting this mermaid. Yeah, Annie? Um, I think I'll try for a short answer. Uh, for me, I'm sorry, I apologize for the cat. If I don't let her get in my lap, she'll just fight me more and be even more distracted. So I'm so sorry. Oh, um, the, uh, I think for me, it was my female character, actually. Funnily enough, she was the one who editors kept saying to me, what is she, why is she doing what she's doing? And of course, if you're being asked questions like this, you've either got an idiot as an editor or actually you've got a wise person as an editor. And that's what, of course, I had like, what? Why is she doing? And so her motivation wasn't clear. It took me a long time, weirdly. I prefer writing men. I prefer writing out more specifically. I prefer writing about women through the eyes of men. 
Mm. Um, and so I think it just took me a long time to work out what her issues were, what her motivation is. And uh, what's happening to Anis, which is her name, is that she has had five miscarriages. She keeps giving birth to these kinds of watery creatures that just flow out of her and die. And she hasn't been dealing with that sadness. You know, that kind of when we do that thing of we just get on with it. This woman has lost five children and hasn't cried for those children, not properly. And so it's when I worked out that she needed to stop pretending to be strong. She needed to fall apart. She needed to grieve. Mm. Um, and say, it's a terrible thing that happened to me. And, um, and that some things, you just endure them. They don't go away. You endure them. You have little pockets of pain and there they are. And so she became a really powerful presence throughout the novel because actually her arc has nothing very much to do with a man. She loves Xavier and they will be together and he's very important to her. Um, she loves her husband, even, you know, though he's philandering and, 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 and yeah, anyway, I won't give that away. Um, but the bottom line for Anise actually was to sit with her sisters. I don't mean her <coughs> actual siblings, but with her sisters, with her girls and go, ow, <coughs> ow, I am in pain. And for them to go, yes, hush, baby, hush, we see you. So it took me a long time to get there somehow, which is weird because I have so many sisters in my life and so many women who hold me. It's weird that it took me so long to go, oh, that's the magic for her. It's sisterhood and friendship. Yeah, I think that is important magic for everyone to remember, sisterhood. Okay, cool. So that concludes our panel questions. We only have one question so far from the audience, but if anyone has any more quickly to send to Amanda, that would be um, very cool. Um, it says, how has writing in the genre of magical realism differed from other genres? that you've written? Monique? Um, I just think it gives you a wider scope and a longer leash to exercise your imagination. So realism is fine. I've, I've written, I've actually, one of my books, well, actually magical realism tends to creep into almost everything I do, but you know, with realism, it's cool, it's fine. You know, you're writing a story when nothing magic happens, but as we all know, magic is in our lives. Mm -hmm. It's called synchronicity, it's called serendipity, it's called like cool, weird things happen. We all take drugs and we all fall in love and weird shit happens in our lives all the time. Um, so it gives me, um, it gives me the, <laughs> just gives me such a wide, act. it is lots of, lots more I can do when I just open open that up and put it on the page um just as just by the by the by um i was doing something going back to buddhism recently a type of meditation called lojong which is about being a compassionate warrior and um there was a really really famous buddhist teacher called atisha and he had a big, uh, a name for himself as like a divine, brilliant teacher. And in Tibet, um, the rulers in Tibet wanted him to come up and teach them and teach them because he had such an amazing reputation. But of course, this is a long time ago, it would have taken him a year to get there. And Atisha kept saying, no, I can't get to Tibet. I'm in, I'm somewhere miles away and it, I'm too old. I'm too old. I'm 55. You know, I can't get there. And this, this went backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. And in Tibet, they were all um, into magical Buddhism. They were trying to learn how to fly. They were all trying to learn how to levitate off the ground and fly and do all these crazy stuff. And eventually a teacher said, okay, I'm coming, I'm coming. You guys, it sounds like you need some help. And so a teacher eventually arrives um, with his tea boy. He has a, a boy who is, helps with the tea. And he's brought this little boy all the way from, I don't know, God knows where, Vietnam, Indonesia, some other part of the world. He's come to Tibet and he says, right, I'm ready to teach you. 
And he says, you see all this flying? He says, stop it immediately. He says, we're gonna get back to basics about um, being compassionate to other people. He says, you see my tea boy? <laughs> he says, he is my teacher. He is really annoying. I don't <laughs> like him. He pisses me off every day. He's a pain in the ass. I brought him all the way from wherever I was because every time I look at him, I get pissed off. <laughs> so, so there's magic in the everyday. There's truth in the magic. There's something there all the time for us to learn, you know, about life. And that's why I, I think this is a cool way to, to think about um, the way life is. It's like this magic in the everyday. Mm. I mean, I think, I mean, I work in several genre and uh, uh, like Monique, um, uh, you know, the magic creeps in, uh, but sometimes it doesn't. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I would differentiate between magic realism, for example, and horror. So sometimes I write straight up horror fiction um, and for the glory of scaring the fuck out of people um, and or trying to, or just creeping people out. Um, sometimes I write, like Monique, uh, straight erotica um, for the glory of uh, turning people on and arousing people, but also making them think more about what sexual spaces are. Um, there's realism as well, even though I find more and more I'm attracted to the essay as a form, um, you know, so really, you know, nonfiction. Um, I don't, I would be surprised if I write a lot of straight up realism in the future. Only because what I'm interested in is 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 being is being happy. <laughs> uh, back to sentimentality, but it's true. I'm interested in pleasing myself. I'm interested in um, smiling a lot when I write. I'm interested in speaking the truth, and so I keep going to that space of oh weird shit. Someone you know cracks an egg, and a small dragon leaves the egg. I'm you know, trying to write about breakfast and this dragon is suddenly, you know, crawling up somebody's nose while they're trying to scramble eggs. It's a tendency. It's a habit. I like it. It makes me smile. So I think I'm going to keep on doing it. I agree with Leonie. For me, it's a tendency. It's, it's like, you know, some people do this and some people do that. And I happen to do this. I happen to be this way. When I, you know, when I want to write, shit starts to happen <laughs> you know things start to go in a particular way it's just it's just it's just so it's thing. Do. so we do yeah yeah that's good though I, yeah okay um we also have another question which is have you found a way to incorporate the lyrical storytelling element of magical realism Okay, sorry. <laughs> Have you found a way to incorporate the lyrical storytelling element of magical elements and narrative nonfiction? I think magical realism and narrative nonfiction. Not yet. That's That'd very be interesting. Good. That's yeah, a really interesting proposition. That's a very good question. Not yet, no. <laughs> I think I'd agree, not yet. <laughs> I think yeah, I'm not saying not it's not doable, no, but yeah. that's totally cool. And I would that's say, good. if you're an emerging writer, or you want to write, do that, do it. That's a good And tell us what happens. Um, oh, what would you tell your writing self if you could go back now to when you first started? Everything's gonna be okay. Mm. Oh, uh, we may as well just have one of us here, really. You, Malik, you just talk because everything you say, I agree with. Everything's going to be okay. Yeah. You're going to be okay. You're yeah. not bad. You're quite a good writer. Yeah. It'll be okay. <laughs> I mean, I was about six when I tried to start writing. So I think I tell my six year old self almost exactly the same thing is like, I think I'd say to her, honey, you write. Yeah. You write about nearly everything, particularly what goes on the page. So don't let nobody make you feel any. I would say feel any shame. Just do the thing, because you're right. Yeah, I would say. We um, see when we when we started or when I started was twenty years ago. It wasn't the same atmosphere as it is now for women or for women of color or for women who were different, you know, marginal, whatever. But particularly for women, 
so when I announced that I was going to do this, it was still only men do only men do this. Only certain type of man should try this. Mm. You mean writing across the board? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. For for uh, I mean, as a novelist especially, it was a man's thing. You know, it's men do this. You know, it's man men do this. I mean, I come from you know my parents were fairly certain type. My father tried to write a novel at one point. It's not done. Don't even think about it. So um, I would say, you know, I would sort of say to a young Monique, you know, you're good. It's going to be difficult. There'll be lots of bumps. But you're good. Don't let anyone, you know, don't. Yeah, you're bad. You're badass. Do it. I mean, I was brought up by very creative, you know, left wingers who were atheists, who thought it was a fabulous idea that I should write books. And they thought this was really great. And my mother often jokes that she thinks one day, and we're running out of time, I will write that book that outsells the Bible. Um, so I had lots of, ostensibly lots of support and encouragement to be this creative yeah. person. So it's interesting because then life comes along and licks you upside your head, you know what I mean? And makes you ponder and wonder and worry and, God, what was I worried about? What was I worried about? That's the, you know, you just think really, it, um, why was I so worried? You go and piss off somebody. Somebody gonna That's tell true. you the wrong That's language. True. Somebody gonna tell you that you get it wrong. Somebody right now still, you know, Monique is award winning. You know, people read my work and quite like it too. And 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 still people gonna tell us, some reviewer will tell us, some reader will tell us, some part of the fucking internet will tell us you're wrong. Um, Maybe we are sometimes wrong. You know, humans get to be wrong. But I, I think- I, You can't please everybody. That's you can't, definitely you true. Can't. And if I, you're not strong happening. enough, yeah. if you mind, if you really mind when someone tells you you're wrong and you're stupid and, you, and you're bad, then don't get, this is, if your skin, it, it, I've definitely had um, people say, get the fuck out of here. You don't belong here. You're not one of us. Mm -hmm. I've had that mm -hmm. more than once. You know, you don't belong here. That's disgusting. Um, yeah, can't I, I, please everybody. I can't can't not please really, everybody. not giving a shit about what I write about. And by by people, I mean people in industry. You know, opportunities drying up, nobody waiting for the next book, all of that kind of stuff. You know, yeah. you sit yeah. in you sit in shame about that. Yeah. You no, know, we could talk all night about the complexities and the toxicity of this industry, even in the context of wonderful editors and people who love literature. There is, you know. It, publishing is simple simple publishing is capitalism you know so i had to make peace with maybe i'd tell my younger self you were right to have reservations about publishing i always wanted to publish since i was a little girl i wanted a book i can't tell you how that little thing that they have on the front of the front page that says copyright leonie ross <gasps> i used to get books and write it in and write out people's names and put my name there i always wanted this thing and yet i remember publishing my first novel back in 1996 and wondering what have i just done to my creative self was this actually a good idea? And it turns out that there are the, the process of entering capitalism. And by that, I just mean, you know, here is a product that we will sell for money. And if you make money, things will be good. And if you don't make money, things will be bad. That binary, that dynamic is terrible for creativity. So I think I just tell my little girl self, you're right, all of that is rubbish. Attend to your sentences attend to your sentences. And if you don't make no money, oh well, attend to the metaphors, the similes, the truth, the authenticity, the detail, the love, do that. Because you can't control anything else. Including foolish men who tell us that we shouldn't do it in the first place. It's not just men, by the way, but it's, it's men a lot of the time. <laughs> Sorry, men in the room, who I see lo several lovely men who I like a lot in the room. I, what she said. <laughs> okay well. i think it's getting easier for women i can see it's 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 easier it's softer experience for when i see women who are like 20 years younger than me i can see that they're not having quite such a hard time well i hope they're not i don't know uh women of color i'm not so sure 
yes, we're in a kind of golden age at the moment, but I'm waiting. I want to see it in 10 years. I want to yeah, see I hear that. Uh, us in um, positions of power. I want to see us in decision-making rooms, not just being published. This is the way in which that can be the latest sexy thing, you know? So I may sound like a cynic, but I would like, I agree with you, Mom, that it's getting better for women. women I, I think it, when I look at the more. young woman coming up in Trinidad, mm -hmm. I can see that nobody's coming in to kill them. Mm -hmm. You know, whereas when I was first, you know, published, everybody wanted that, that, that kill that, ch kill she dead, ting, mm -hmm. kill her. So that, but that's complicated as well. But I think, I hope it's slightly easier, especially for women of color, for queer and women, anybody, point. anybody who isn't normative, I, I, or, you know, anybody who's, you know, I just hope it's easier for women generally as well. I'm conscious of the time and I'm conscious that <laughs> We've gone over the hour. I don't know. Is that yes, we may be boring people, but the good thing about Zoom is that if we're boring them, they can just go away. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There you go. I was going to say thank you very much. We have gone over our time technically, but I'm just enjoying the conversation so much. I just don't want it to end. But yeah, um, so thank you very much for coming and appearing on our panel. It was a, an honor to host you and to talk to Marissa, you. Marissa, can I ask you a question? Anything. What, my darling, have you learned from this experience? Because you have all worked very hard behind the scenes to do this. What have you learned for yourself? From the whole experience or just from this, this panel? Whatever, whatever, whatever works for you. I've learned that um, I shouldn't be so scared to put myself into new spaces. This is the first panel I've ever hosted. I got your name wrong at the beginning. I, 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 when I started, I thought my laptop was going to shut down. Before I joined, I was like, oh my gosh, like I'm so scared. But I done it and I've sat down and I've had a conversation with two really amazing women who I looked up to you to do before talking to you because obviously I read your work and I'm an English student. I have love for literature. I have love for everything that books and words can do to people and you know how they can make me feel personally. And it's just been just so amazing just talking to you and like understanding your points of views and I think that when you talk to an author of, of something or a writer of something you get a whole different dynamic whole different layer to their work that you maybe didn't see before so that also has been really really I'm quite thankful for this opportunity is what I'm trying to say <laughs> but yeah well, I'm really I'm I'm really proud of you that you were scared and you did it anyway most oh, things you. <laughs> scared and we do it anyway most things most things yeah so I that you did that yay for you thank you very much i appreciate that um oh, what's this? um oh i've got someone else saying i've done all right well that's lovely okay <laughs> but yeah so thank you everyone for coming